So unlike Andy's paper or, or work, this is very much work in progress. So my goal here is to give you just a peek of um, what are the questions I'm asking and, and uh, how, what are the techniques I'm using to answer this question. And this is joint work with Javier Bianchi from University of Wisconsin. So um, just to give you a, a little bit of groundwork of uh, what this work is about, let me read this slight piece from, from The Economist that came out two weeks ago. So it says, mainstream macro models fail to represent some of the most basic realities of the financial system. One reason is that doing that is hard. Another that is that um, for a long time it did not seem to make uh, much difference. In the absence of a crisis, the activities of the financial sector can appear irrelevant for long stretches of time. Small wonder why so many academics model the economy as if banks and no other um, intermediaries simply do not exist. <coughs> The crisis, which was completely unanticipated by the vast majority of academics and policymakers, revealed some of the drawbacks of these shortcuts. In response, a few scholars are trying to rebuild the field. I agree with it. everything except um, rebuilding the field. Um, I think that's a little bit of a stretch, <laughs> but we're trying to um, think of um, financial intermediaries in the context of macroeconomic models. So why, why is this question important? Why, why is it um, intriguing me? Because um, the answer is because the, over the last five years, uh, monetary policy around the world has, has changed dramatically. So let me show you some facts. Okay, the conduct of monetary policy has changed. And so let me show you some facts. Um, the, these red bars are the, 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 the policy instruments that the, the, the Federal Reserve uses to implement um, its monetary uh, policy targets. The blue line is the outcome of that, of, that, um, of that policy strategy. What you see in this graph is that prior to the crisis, the Fed has a very tight control over interest rates. During the crisis, it loses, let me do a, let me do a, um, a zoom, it loses its control. Um, other things that happen during the crisis is that oftentimes, in every other uh, episode in time, when the Fed uh, reduces its, its interest rates, you see a rapid um, uh, response by, by, by the banking sector. Maybe three months after, maybe six months a after, after you see a reduction in, in uh, interest rates, banks are responding by, by uh, lending more. You don't see that in th this during the recession. It takes over a year to start seeing an improvement in, in lending conditions. Um, something that um, macroeconomists often look at is the money multiplier. The money multiplier is um, a measurement of how much the Fed is expanding the, uh, uh, the quantity of reserves relative to the amount of loans granted by, by, by banks or the amount of deposits out there. What you see in the, in the, during the crisis is that the Fed is trying really hard to stimulate um, monetary creation, but, but the private sector is not reacting. So you see a sharp decline in the money multiplier. The only other episode that you see a sh such a sharp decline over the last 100 years is the Great Depression. Um, and the, the, counter, the counterpart of that plot is what's happening with the, the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. So since um, 2008, um, the Fed has been very worried about of, um, the, the lending conditions that banks are, 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 are having. And in an effort to stimulate the economy, they've been lending vast amounts of, of uh, reserves to, to financial institutions. They've bought a lot of their bad uh, mortgages and given them essentially cash. So this is the total amount of money printing, if you want, done by the Fed. Uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, buying um, bad assets from banks. A lot of it has to do with lending directly to banks, giving them more loans. And you know, there are, are other, uh, other things done, like uh, lending facilities, special lending facilities. So that's, that's the side of, um, of, of the Fed. But when you look at the balance sheet from the perspective of uh, financial institutions, and you look at their, um, their required reserves, the amount of reserves they need to be holding on their balance sheet by law, you see only a, uh, you know, you see some, some sharp, um, some slight increase over, over the period after 2008. But when you look at the amount of reserves that they have in excess of what they should be holding, you know, that, ama that, that, um, that amount just dwarfs the, the uh, required reserves. What you, sh you should see after banks are having all these excess reserves is that they should be lending like crazy because essentially um, 
managing liquidity is no longer a problem. They have all this excess um, um, reserve. But you don't see a reaction on, on the side of banking institutions. Um, lending in many, over many different sources um, has not been reactivated, not even after the, the recession has ended. Um, on the liability side of banks, um, the amount of deposits that banks are holding is actually coming down or has been coming down post, post recession. Um, these are total liabilities by banks. So what is the connection between these, these things? Part of the, you know, the, 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 the problems with the financial sector has been all these huge losses that banks face with a um, subprime mess. Right? And so in the upper panel, uh, in the red curve, I'm showing you the market value, the market capitalization of the top 50 bank institutions in the US. And you see that the market capitalization has dropped by more than 50%. More than it has recovered partially, but not, not nearly all the way. And you see it, um, say, in the, that gray uh, line is the amount of lending done for investment purposes. And the corollary of that is what's happening on, on the real sector, which is real investment. That's the blue side. So investment has not yet recovered. Um, so these facts cast some doubts about the ability that the Fed has to stimulate the economy, the uh, ability to promote monetary creation or uh, lending that is essential for, for, um, for any economic activity. So the view that I have is that if the financial sector was at the epicenter of the financial crisis and if we understand that monetary policy operates through the financial sector, we have a task in trying to understand how is it that the transmission of mechanism of monetary policy is carried out when banks are in trouble? So that's what I'm after. So maybe something is going wrong in the system and we, we, we need to find a, a way to patch things. Um, so we want to have a model of, you know, that, that captures a, a realistic description of what banks, banks do. Okay, so the, the applications of having a model of this sort, which I'm going to describe in a second, are the following. We want to answer some questions. So how is it that monetary policy changes when um, banks are in trouble? Is there anything changing in, in, in the way that um, um, banks act that is preventing the Fed from stimulating the economy? Um, maybe the, the Fed is not able to stimulate um, um, lending because banks are facing tighter regulations. So on the one hand, you have, you have the Fed trying to stimulate Lending, on the other hand, you may have things like um, Basel, the regulatory requirements on, on banks that is <coughs> operating in the opposite direction, saying, you know, for the amount of equity that you have, you, you cannot lend more than, more than this amount. So maybe you have policies that are going in different directions. Um, and you, you want to answer, you want to have a model that allows you to answer questions like, um, will the Fed be able to, if, if inflation, if you start see, um, seeing uh, that this, um, monetary stimulus translates into inflation, would the Fed be able to, um, to um, you know, retract on this position? So those are the type of questions that, that I want to answer. So for that, I want a model that captures the basic problems that banks face. And for me, the basic problems that banks face are two. One is liquidity management. That is managing the trade-offs between making a loan and running out of cash. I'm going to give you a description of what I mean by that in a second. And the other problem is risk management, figuring out who to lend. So for the rest of the you know, 10 minutes remaining, I'm only, only going to focus on the first problem. So let me give you a description of what this liquidity management problem is from a, from a textbook perspective. So let's start with a balance sheet of a, of a, of a bank. So those of you who were my, my students in GE1 will recognize this chart. Okay, so banks have the following composition in their balance sheets. Uh, on the one hand, they have this green stuff that are reserves, and they have loans on their asset side. And the liabilities, they have equity and they have deposits. They issue a special type of liability. It's not bonds, it's not securities, it, it's demand deposits. In reality, it's more complex than this because there are things like currency, which are not reserves. When I'm talking about reserves, I'm talking about electronic reserves. And they have treasuries. So they buy assets um, that are issued by the, by, the, by the federal government, right? But for now, let's focus on only two types of assets, loans and reserves. And let's think of reserves as highly liquid assets, 
And let's think of loans as highly illiquid assets, assets that cannot be traded from bank to bank. The reason being that banks have special expertise in certain types of loans. Maybe they, um, they're specialized in a certain industry, or maybe they know which loans are paying um, in, in time and which no loans aren't. And then on the other hand, the liabilities that they have are, play a special role as a medium of exchange. People can use these liabilities to buy, buy a car or buy inputs for the production or, or, or pay payroll, for example, if you're talking about a firm, or pay their mortgage services. And so on. That's, that's a special type of, of, of asset that, uh, which, which plays the role of a medium of exchange that not every asset out there does. You cannot go buy a house with, um, you know, with, with bonds, right? So this is the balance sheet. And so what do banks do with this balance sheet? They can choose. Um, to expand or shrink this balance sheet at their own will. Because they can grant new loans, and when they grant new loans, essentially what they do is they give whoever borrowers coming to their, to their doors a checkbook. And that guy can start making payments with that checkbook. Right? And that, those, as, at the time in which it starts making those, pay, those payments with that checkbook, those checks eventually end up in that bank as, as deposits. So it, they end up being a liability for that bank, and the bank is, of course, charging an interest rate. So making loans for a bank is actually a very attractive, uh, attractive exercise. It's making uh, interest rates uh, on those loans. So let's focus on this balance sheet for a second, or let's shrink it for a second, and let's think of what the bank is doing with this. So the bank is giving these checks to a firm, right? Now, the firm has a liability against the bank, that's the loan, Right? And there's a negative equity because the, the firm is at that second, at that immediate second when it receives um, that loan is re having a, a, a negative entry because it has to pay those interest rates. But the firm, of course, is going to use those checks to make a payment. Say, for example, you can pay workers to come into that firm and generate some goods. So at, the point in, at that point in time, the, f the firm gives the checks to the household and it generates some goods that it's going to store in its warehouses. Right? Nothing has happened with the bank so far. Now, the bank can pay some part of the interest rate to, the, to its shareholders, and that's going to be even more deposits. And you can pay them in the form of checks. So you know you have households there. So households are going to use those checks back and buy stuff from, from, from firms. They're going to buy these goods. And eventually, the firm is going to have those checks in its asset side. It can pay the loan then. Right? Loans are out, and deposits are out. And then households have those goods. So you know, banks are making a profit. And the, this um, deposit creation is playing an essential role in, in the economy. It's allowing these households, which would have not gone to work if the firm cannot pay them, um, that, that essential role is played by banks. And it's creating um, 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 real assets in the economy, real goods in the economy. So that's, that's the balance sheet of a bank, nothing changed. So in the morning, when it decides to make the loans, its balance sheet expands, it makes some profits, uh, and it creates some liabilities. So that's good for, for the economy, it's good for banks, right? So um, yeah, so I, I just told you what these, these, things, what these things are, right? From a monetary perspective, <coughs> bank reserves, are what the Fed chooses um, as the amount of money out there that banks are holding. And then the sum of all deposits uh, plus reserves is the total money, uh, quantity of money. Right? Because it's, it's the, the amount of mediums of exchange out there in, in an economy. So loans are granted by issuing deposits. And deposits are an essential asset because they are a medium of exchange. Right? So, now, there's a trade-off faced by banks when they make a loan. The reason being that when it's creating a loan, it's creating a liability, a deposit, and those deposits don't have to stay in that bank. Whoever has the checks from that bank doesn't need to keep its deposits in that bank. And that imposes some risks for the financial institution. Because when deposits are changing from one bank to another, that's um, um, changing the formal liabilities from one bank, one bank, one bank to the other, and that's, that induces some costs for the bank. So let me show you how. So suppose some, some 
some deposits are withdrawn from this particular balance sheet to another balance sheet, another bank will not accept loans as a counterparty to, that, um, to taking those liabilities. Um, it wants only the liquid assets, whatever the, the bank can trade, and those are the, the bank reserves. Now, one thing that can happen is that a withdrawal is small and the bank has enough reserves um, to make that payment. But something else can happen, which is there's a very large withdrawal and the bank doesn't have enough reserves to finance that, that deficit. And in that case, that bank needs to patch the deficit by borrowing from another bank. But of course, if the bank itself charges an interest rate, the bank is going to also be charged an interest rate when it, when it borrows from another bank. And these are equity losses for the bank. Right? And so a bank that has a high liquidity shock will shrink its, its equity if it has a, you know, a, a high withdrawal and needs to borrow. So that's, the trade, that's where the trade-off is coming. The bigger your balance sheet, the, more, the higher the amount of deposits that you have, you cannot create reserves. So since you're creating deposits and you're inducing a risk of a withdrawal by creating more deposits while keeping your reserves constant, that induces a risk for the bank because the risk of running out of reserves is higher and that's costly for you. That's a trade-off that banks face. And so monetary policy operates by altering that trade-off, right? It can do many, many things. So one thing it can do is, it's, it's, that's its traditional mechanism to um, alter lending, is open market operations. One thing it can do is open market operations. That is, that's a big purchase. Let me show you a second. That's a big purchase of loans in exchange for reserves. So if banks suddenly, at some point in time, have more reserves than they had in the morning, they can make even more loans because their liquidity risk is reduced. They have more reserves to meet you know, a higher amount of withdrawals. Right? Other things they can do is they can change the interest rate at which banks are, are lending to each other by saying, look, if anybody needs to borrow, I can lend you at this particular interest rate. Or you can set, for example, what is the amount of reserves that you must hold? Those are reserve requirements. So what we're doing here in this paper is trying to um, come up with a model where monetary policy has effects by altering that trade-off. And by doing that, we're trying to come up with explanations to all of the patterns that I described you earlier on. What's been going on during the last recession? The Fed is expanding the amount of reserves by banks. Yet, banks are not reacting as you would expect from this model. The reason is that they're not lending as they should, given the high amount of reserves that they have. So we can use this model as a laboratory to try to figure out what may be going on with banks, which explains the patterns. So let me give you a glimpse of what my model does. And I, I have no answers so far to all of the questions I've, I've presented. This is the things you can get out of this model. You can test things like what happens if banks suffer equity losses over time? What happens if they face more withdrawal risk? What happens if they have meeting weaker demand conditions or face tighter regulation or you know, face a new monetary policy regime? Right? Notice that these are very difficult questions to answer because as opposed to that very simple diagrammatic example, banks need to take very complicated decisions into account. They need to predict what's going to happen in the future. They need to predict what interest rates are going to be in the future. They need to figure out whether they should pay dividends or, or, or try to raise equity and so forth. Right? So you need a very rich description for, for these things. And so let me, let me, let me try to um, use the model as a laboratory to explain what happens if suddenly, out of the blue, there's a, de there's a demand shock and suddenly firms no longer want to take loans. What should we expect with monetary aggregates and banking decisions? And this is a permanent shock. So you know, there's been a reduction in the economy, the demand for loans, and it's going to stay there for, say, two, three, four years. So one thing you would expect is banks will start reducing the amount of equity they hold. 
and they're going to start paying dividends. They're going to start cutting down loans, and they're going to start charging um, lower interest rates on loans. So the interest rate will come down if there's less demand for these loans. And the amount of reserves should drop. And you should also think, see things like the value of banks should be coming down as well. The return on loans should be coming down. The leverage of banks should be coming down. Um, and you should see the money multiplier tanking, although the Fed is, um, if it doesn't react, right, you should see also a reduction in bank reserves because banks don't need, no longer need reserves if they're going to make less loans. And um, you can see things like a you know, contraction in the amount of lending, a contraction in the amount of bank reserves, and so forth. Of course, this picture, this, these pictures don't fit what's occurring in the data because in the data what you see is a an increase in the amount of cash and the, a decrease in the amount of loans. So um, um, a contraction in demand cannot be the full story for things. So we're, we're using this model as a laboratory to understand these questions. Thanks.